So good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr Nicolene Lottering and this sub video constitutes part three of a four part lecture on the clinical anatomy of back pain. Specifically this lecture is going to focus on the muscular arrangement of the back. So the learning objectives for this lecture are to identify and familiarize yourself with the muscle constituents and actions of the trunk to be able to locate and describe the three layers of back muscles, including the muscles that constitute this, and then to be able to describe the movement relationship between the pelvis and the vertebral column for the full range of trunk movements. So as we've discussed, the most common cause of back pain is going to be muscle-related injuries, and quite often these are going to be related to um, maintaining the correct posture or are going to be a consequence of um, occupation or workplace related um, injuries or ergonomics. So if we then consider the main movement or range of movement of the spine, the spine is going to allow for flexion and extension. So if you're flexing the spine, try touching your toes with your fingertips. If you're extending, imagine leaning back and yawning. In addition, the spine is capable of lateral flexion. So if you're stretching or bending from left to right, and then we can also rotate the spine. Or if you imagine shaking your head from side to side, this is going to be a rotational movement. So just building on the previous lecture then, part of your revision activity is to be able to summarize the main movements associated with each of the spinal segments. If we then look at the specific muscles of the back, these can be divided up into two groups. So firstly, we have the intrinsic muscles of the back, and these muscles are going to be your deep muscle group. So the true back muscles are going to be characterized by their position and their innervation by branches of the dorsal rami of the spinal nerve. So the true back muscles are going to be those located below the neck and are going to be deep to the posterior thoracic columbar fascia. The function of these intrinsic muscles really are to maintain posture and to allow for and support movement of the vertebral column. Superficial to this then, we then have the extrinsic muscles of the back. So these are also called the immigrant muscles and collectively they function to move the upper limb and root. So what we mean by this is there are two subgroups known as the superficial group and the intermediate group. The superficial group is going to function to move the upper limb only and these are going to be muscles such as the deltoid and the trapezius for instance which have been covered in your upper limb anatomy sessions and then the intermediate group is just going to be deep to this group which is muscles such as serratus posterior inferior and superior and they function as respiratory or proprioceptive. So if we then try and visualize these three layers of muscles, the best way to do this is to look at a cross-sectional view as we have in this corner. So the superficial and intermediate muscles are depicted in light blue or green. We can see most medial. We have the trapezius and latissimus dorsi, which are going to be part of our superficial muscle group. Just immediately deep to this, we have serratus posterior, which is part of our intermediate muscle group, so only respiratory in function. So notice when we're actually looking at this illustration here, we can only see the superficial muscle groups. We haven't actually dissected them away to reveal the intrinsic ones. And then bringing us to the intrinsic, we can see in red and purple, we have our deep muscles, which are again subdivided into two main groups. So the erecta spina, which are going to be the most lateral, most vertical, the biggest muscle groups. And then we have the transverse spinalis, which as the name implies, runs between the transverse process and the spinous processes. So if we look at this overview then, so myofascial or muscle pain is characterized by pain and tenderness over trigger points. So in addition, you are going to find a loss of range of motion in the muscle groups involved. And we're also going to find pain radiating in a characteristic distribution, but usually is restricted to a peripheral nerve. So if we're then walking through this summary slide provided, in the upper layer, we can see muscles big muscle groups such as the trapezius and the latissimus dorsi, 
which span a large portion of the back. If we strip this away, we can reveal our rhomboid muscles, as well as more intricate rotator cuff muscles, such as the infraspinatus, um, teres minor, for instance. If we strip this away, once again, we reveal our intermediate muscle groups. So we have serratus posterior, superior, and inferior. We also have muscles such as levator scapula. So the levator scapula muscle helps to elevate the scapula, and accordingly, it's going to attach on the supromedial aspect of the scapula and then insert onto um, the skull. So don't fret, most of this muscle pain can be relieved through massage, for instance, or um, and then if we strip this away, we start to reveal this intrinsic muscle group. So if you look at the erecta spina muscles, these are going to be orientated in a fairly column-like arrangement, and we can see that they are running all the way from the base of the skull and then inserting or anchoring down onto um, the sacrum as well as the ilium bones. And this is really going to help to provide that postural stability, but you can imagine that when you're flexing and extending, it is going to be these pillars that help to control the eccentric contraction to help avoid um, muscle damage, for instance. So then if we look at the superficial muscles, so the muscles in the superficial group have been covered in upper limb anatomy, but we will just go through them for revision. So these muscles are going to be in, located immediately deep to the skin and the superficial fascia, and they function to attach the superior part of the appendicular skeleton, so the clavicle, scapula, and numerus, to the axial skeleton. So there are five main muscles that are going to constitute the superficial muscles. So the first diamond-like structure is going to be the trapezius. We have the latissimus dorsi, which is going to be located inferior to that. We also have the rhomboid minor and major, which will be evident once we strip away the trapezius muscle. And then as we've mentioned before, we have the levator scapula, which is going to course from the scapula, inserting onto that cervical spine. If we look at the function of each of these muscles, trapezius is going to assist us in rotating the scapula during the initiation of abduction of the humerus. It is also going to function to elevate and depress the scapula. Structures such as levator scapula, as the name implies, will help to elevate the scapula just based on its attachment points. In conjunction with the rhomboid muscles which are going to adduct, so bring the arm or scapula back in towards the midline of the body, as well as aid in elevation. If we look at latissimus dorsi specifically, it is going to help to extend as well as adduct and medially rotate the humerus. So using the essential anatomy depiction then, we can see based on several views, so we have an anterior, a posterior and lateral views, just how wide spanning this trapezius muscle is and it's arranged in this classic diamond shape. So accordingly if we're looking at the origins, the origins are going to be depicted in red. So remember an origin is going to be the attachment point that has the least movement. So usually this is going to be the anchoring effect onto the trunk. So we have the superior neutral line, which is going to be located um, on the occipital bone along with the external occipital protuberance. And then we have spinous processes all the way from the cervical spine down to T12. The insertion, on the other hand, is going to be the fanning out of the muscle. So we have the spine of scapula as well as the acromion. And then we also have insertions onto the lateral third of the clavicle. Latissimus dorsi then, we can see it's also a fairly wide spanning muscle and it's essentially going to be about half the size of our diamond. So again, red is going to denote the origin. The origins are going to be um, the spinous processes of the sacrum as well as spinous processes of T7 down to L5. We also then have an origin anchoring it down to the iliac crest as well as ribs 10 through to 12. 
so occupying most of that posterior space. The only insertion then for this muscle is going to be the intertubercular sulcus of the humerus, which is just going to be located distal to the neck of the humerus. So this is why the main function is going to be to act on, so adduct and medially rotate the humerus because of this insertion point. And then lastly, the muscle that you're going to strain if you carry your heavy backpacks or you've been studying for too long is going to be the levator scapula, which functions to elevate the scapula. Its origin is going to be the transverse processes of C1 to C4, and its insertion is going to be the upper border of the medial scapula over here. So the adjacent images are just denoting um, in red where we have our origins and then just showing us the relationship between the scapula onto that bony skeleton. If we then move to the intermediate muscles, so these consist of two muscle sheets located on the superior and inferior regions of the back. As the name implies, they are deep to the superficial muscles and there are only two. So we have serratus posterior superior and inferior, and they're arranged in this nice serrated or blade-like fanning arrangement of muscles. Their function is going to be purely respiratory. So when we're breathing in and out, it is going to be these muscle groups that help in the expansion and contraction of the rib cage along with the intercostal muscles. And then lastly, probably the most important muscle groups are going to be the deep or the intrinsic muscles. The deepest muscles are also going to have a lot of muscle spindles. So this means that they're going to have a high proportion of stretch receptors, which are going to be mainly proprioceptive. So this means that there is a correlation between injury associated with the intrinsic muscles as a cause of back pain. So if we look at visualizing the location of these muscles, they are going to extend from the pelvis to the skull and they are innervated by the branches of the posterior rami of the spinal nerves. So these include muscles that are going to extend and rotate the head and neck. So specific muscles such as splenius capitis and cervicus, which are going to be located in the C-spine region. We also then have muscles that extend and rotate the rest of the vertebral column, which are going to be your erecta spina and transverso spinalis muscle groups. Collectively, the function of the intrinsic muscles is to maintain the posture and control movements of the vertebral column and head through eccentric contraction. So these muscles can then be subdivided into three layers. So most superficially, we have the splenius muscles. Strip those away, we have our erecta spina muscles, which are going to be these long column-like muscles which run all the way from the skull down into the pelvis and then we have the transverse spinalis muscles which are going to be even deeper to these but they're going to be the intrinsic little ones that are running laterally through the vertebral column from the spinous processes to the transverse processes. And we will endeavor to go into these individually too. So the splenius muscles are going to be those that attach for the most part to the skull and then anchor down either onto the cervical spine or midway through the thoracic spine. And their collective function is going to be extension of the head and neck. So when you're trying to tuck your chest with your chin, this is going to be extension of the head and neck. So if you're stretching your head backwards to look up at the sky or at the stars, this is going to be extension and then rotation of the head to look towards your left or right when you're crossing the street it is going to be your splenius muscles that are activated. So the origins and insertions are going to help you with locating where these are. And these muscles can either work together or they can work individually. So splenius capitis is going to originate from the ligamentum nuchae and then anchor down onto the spinous processes of C7 to T4. And it's going to insert onto the mastoid process of the skull as well as part of the occipital bone. So this means the head is going to be the point of attachment that moves the most. So when left and right sides work together, they're going to draw the head backward or extend, and then individually, they're going to assist with rotating the head from side to side as one shortens and one 
extends to allow that to happen. Splenius cervicus, on the other hand, is going to be a bit deeper and more inferior. Its origin is going to be spinous processes of T3 to T6, and it's going to insert onto C1 to C3. Again, it's going to function in extending the neck, and it's also going to function to help rotate the head from side to side. So these really do work together. So our intermediate group then, is going to be the largest group of intrinsic back muscles. And these are called the erecta spina muscle group. These consist of nine muscles. You do not need to know the individual origins and insertions of each. It is a good idea to learn how to locate these muscles and to know their functions. So the erecta spina muscles lie posterolaterally to the vertebral column, and they're going to be covered in the thoracic and lumbar regions by a structure known as the thoracocolumbar fascia, and we also have the superficial muscles. They're going to arise from the sacrum, spinous processes of the lumbar and lower thoracic vertebrae, as well as the iliac crest, as we can see by this fascia over here. So the collective functions then, firstly, are going to be prime extensors of the vertebral column and the head. They are going to help to straighten the back, so when you flex and touch your toes, it is going to be the erecta spina that help to control the body or spine to bring it back up to that neutral position. And it's also going to help to pull the head posteriorly while doing so. And then thirdly, it does have a role, so an eccentric role in helping to slowly lower the vertebral column down into a flexion position when you are reaching for the ground and touching your toes. If we go through some of the examples of the individual muscles, we can see that the muscles most medially and almost running at a 45 degree angle are going to be the spinalis thoracis muscle group of the erecta spina. Immediately lateral to that, we have our longissimus cervicus group in the cervical region longissimus thoracis in the thoracic region. So together this just makes the longissimus muscle group. And then even most lateral to that we have the iliocostalis muscle which as the name suggests runs from the ilium and is going to insert onto the intercostal muscles or onto the rib. So this sort of makes sense if we try and break it down. And then we strip all of that away and we reveal these really nice, fine, intrinsic muscles, which are going to be the transverso spinalis muscles, which are going to run obliquely upward and medially from the transverse processes to the spinous process. So this fills the groove between these two vertebral projections. These can then be subdivided into three subgroups. So we have the semispinalis which are going to function to extend and laterally flex the vertebral column. So these are going to be the longest ones located um, obliquely. As soon as we start getting down into our lumbar region, we have the multifidus muscles, which are going to extend laterally, flex and rotate the vertebral column. And then the last one, the tiniest little muscles over here are going to be the rotoris muscles, which function to rotate the vertebral column. These work together bilaterally. They're going to have a common function to extend the back. If they're working unilaterally, they're going to rotate the back. And that's all that I have for you in reviewing the muscles of the back.